Um, okay, other questions? From last time. You had one question on on limbo, right? What's that? Which I did not answer. Um, and I, and uh, we didn't know we didn't get to it. And it is right here in your catechism. So open up to 1250 something while I find it. Oh, there it is. 1261. 1261. Wait, I didn't know if they had an extra. I think I gave them all out. Oh, in there. Okay. All right, 1261, in regards to children who have died without baptism, the church can only entrust them to the mercy of God, as she does in her funeral rites for them. Indeed, the great mercy of God, who desires that all men should be saved, and Jesus' tenderness toward children, which caused him to say, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, allow us to hope that there is a way of salvation for children who have died without baptism. All the more urgent is the church's call not to prevent little children coming to Christ through the gift of holy baptism. So look, and it's right in the section on the necessity of baptism. Saying baptism is necessary for salvation. Why? Because Christ our God told us so. Okay? However, however, we open the doors wide in a sense. We don't, we don't want to put anything that's going to, in a sense, say, no, it's not possible for God can work even beyond the sacramental system, although it's beyond our knowledge of how it happened. Right? So based upon revelation, no, this is the only way we know. However, we don't bind the hands of God. So yes, we hope, we commend their souls, um, we can commend their souls to the Lord, but we don't know. Traditionally, in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, there has been a theological speculation that there may be a place like limbo. And I use that language, theological speculation, because that's exactly what it has always been. You will never see a dogmatic uh, uh, pronouncement of the church on limbo. It never has happened. It never will happen, because it's theological speculation based upon what is said right here. We have hope, and we commend them to God, although we, we do not know how. It could happen. So could it be possible there would be a place where the children do not suffer and yet do not enjoy the fullness of the beatific vision, which is a direct result of our baptism into Christ Jesus, who is the one who beholds the Father? Okay? So, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, if we believe that Christ ascended into hell to save those who came before him, Right. Who did not have the opportunity to know about Christ. Right. An unbaptized child, by right. the same logic, yeah. as well as the, you know, we used to say in the old days, you know, the, the savages in the depths of uh, right. the jungle somewhere, who didn't, who never had the opportunity to know about yeah. God, Jesus, and so if God saved, you know, the, the people before, sure. surely He can save those yeah. after. He, he, he absolutely I mean, can, right? It's, well, it's, but it's, if He it's, did, if we believe that He did, why well, wouldn't no. I believe? Because there's something different about an unbaptized um, uh, infant who dies, okay, or the savage in the wilderness, different than those whom we believe that Christ saved at the moment of his descent into Hades. Those he saved at the moment of his descent into Hades were the just men of the Old Testament who had lived a righteous life, right? So in a sense, had made an act of faith without having enough knowledge, done the best they could do, right? And so people like Noah, Adam, these people that lived a righteous life. So that's who we're talking about. So you want to be careful that we're not talking about when he descended into Hades, just generally everybody that came before him. We're talking about people who had walked the life of virtue, right? They so, should, they had to, they they must, yeah. But why not? hang on the cross with Jesus Christ. Right. Sure. He, would, he would never live a righteous life. 
Yes, but again, he makes that act of faith. And so the problem is the child has not made an act of faith, nor have the parents done so, and we have a problem. So I just I leave out that because the church is sitting there saying, look, we don't know. We commend their souls to paradise. We commend their souls to the mercy of God, and we leave it at the mercy of God, and that's it. Yes? But you know, the practical considerations, yeah. is there any reason that children aren't baptized earlier then? As we read in the catechism in our earlier our earlier class, is that we should bring them to baptism as soon as possible. Okay, but as I also said in that class, when the parents make that act of faith, okay, intending fully intending for that child to be baptized, they are in some sense enrolled at that moment into the catechumenate and is recognized as the church as being in the in the bosom of the Lord. Okay, so a person who's, as I said before, driving to their back pit to, to Easter Sunday for their entrance into the church, a catechumen, dies on the way, we we see them has have been received in the church through the baptism by desire. Okay? So the question is the desire point. And it gets tricky. We don't know. We just it's, it's hard to say. Okay, and this doesn't make and pro lifers, all of us sitting here, hopefully, <laughs> and this does not call into question whatsoever the church's love for infants, not at all. Okay, in fact, it shows us the concern in that last sentence: "Do not prevent them from coming to the Lord." Is in Christ alone that they can be saved. Okay. Yeah. I was born in North Carolina. I never knew a Catholic until I moved up here. I was in right. I was Baptist. Yes. So I was baptized in a country of Creek. Yes. In Baptist. Which is preferable. The Catholic Church says that it is preferable to baptize in living water if possible. Living water. So you beat us all out. <laughs> all right. Never to merge. Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's let's move on. We are now we deep too. My dear friends that are here for the first time, we at the beginning of the series changed it a little bit. You're probably all coming because you wanted sacraments of service, but we did change it to sacraments of initiation because there was no way to get through the seven sacraments in three classes. My fault. Whenever you take a class with me, just figure we're just going to get through what we planned for the first day. So, um, so that's where we're at, and we're going to cover chrismation. Now we're stuck with having to do two sacraments in one day because we've really only done one in two classes. Okay. Do I want more? No, no, no. Um, sacrament of confirmation, 1285. 1285. As we go through confirmation in the Eucharist right now, guys, we're going to have to fly, and I'm going to hit points that maybe you don't know or I think are necessary for us to focus on as Catholics, not necessarily getting a full organic whole of the sacrament because there's no way. So, baptism, the Eucharist, and the sacrament of confirmation together constitute the sacraments of initiation, whose unity must be safeguarded. It must be explained to the faithful that the reception of the sacrament of confirmation is necessary for the completion of baptismal grace. So the second time they use necessary now because they just talked about the necessity of baptism and now they're talking about the necessity of confirmation. Okay? And why do you think they say that, the, that their unity must be maintained? Must be safeguarded. Whose unity must be safeguarded. Why? Why would that topic or question even come up? Well, it's kind of like, isn't it that just baptism alone is not quite enough? Isn't that the page is well, well I mean, that's a good question. That's a good question. That's what I'm that's what I'm wondering. You receive I think you grow in sanctifying grace through it's kind of one step. You're, you're growing little by little. Okay. Just in the interior life. True. But why would they even have to bring this point up? Right at the beginning of confirmation. Right there at the beginning. The first thing they say, the unity must be maintained. It must be safeguarded. Why, Henry? To complete the, uh, to complete the uh, initiation. 
I mean, it's necessary for completion. Okay. The baptism the is the beginning. Confirmation is the Baptism, end. confirmation, and the Eucharist are the sacraments of initiation, entrance into the Christian life. If you do not fulfill their full entrance into the Christian life, then you've got, what do you got? A, a, um, cripple. a cripple. cripple. Yeah, it's exactly what you have, a cripple. Right? I oftentimes think of these adults walking around that were never confirmed because we waited till they were in high school. They could make their own church choice to have their you know Christian bar mitzvah, and uh, and how sad it is that they, they don't have the grace to be acting like an adult. Okay, and, 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 and let me be careful. It doesn't mean that they can't act right rightly, but the sacraments are the ones that they give us the this, this strength to be able to act properly in the Christian life. And so we're crippled or we suffer when we're not receiving the sacraments. And that goes not just for baptism, not just for confirmation, but the Eucharist also. Someone who is not receiving the Eucharist on a regular basis is a cripple. Why did okay. confirmation begin? What's that? When did come Wait, well, we're going to talk about that right now. When did it begin? The Roman, right? No. When did when did the sacrament of confirmation begin? When do we look back? So what's the one moment in scripture we have to look to for, for confirmation? Pentecost. Yeah, Pentecost. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter two. Look at that. An extra Bible set right there. Acts chapter two. Before after What's that? <laughs> Acts, right after the Gospels. Right after the Gospels. Two verse eleven. Or I'm sorry, two verse. Um, what do I have eleven? There should be one. Two, one. Yeah, one. Acts chapter two, verse one. What's that? There you go. All right. Well, should read us from verse 1. Uh, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound came from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of fire, distributed and resting on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit gave them others. Okay, and verse 38, chapter 2, verse 38. You want me to? Yep. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so right at the beginning of the... Of the uh, Christian Church, the Catholic Church, you see the gift of the Holy Spirit, something we oftentimes associate with confirmation or chrismation. Okay? Um, we see that through Acts of the Apostles. If you turn to chapter 8 also, um, you'll see the sacrament of confirmation being given in chapter 8. Verse 14. Chapter 8, verse 14. Gretchen, you want to keep reading there for us? Sorry. No, go ahead. That's right. And now when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, now hold on just a second. It's an interesting point there, right? Here we see a distinction between baptism and the giving of the Holy Spirit. So right off the bat, you see this distinction, right? This division. Go ahead. Acts chapter 1, I read it differently because it looks like they have confirmation before they have baptism. Boy, that's a good point. And that happens sometimes in Acts of the Apostles. In fact, I think the next one we were going to look at, that happened where the gift of the Holy Spirit was given as evidence, right? Because they were considering whether they could actually baptize the Gentiles or not. And God steps in and boom, the Holy Spirit descends. And they said, and Peter says, well, who's going to deny water now? Yeah. Right? We talked about that when we did our Acts of the Apostles series. So you're right. And there's a good example of God not being bound to the sacraments as we are bound to the sacraments. Right? Yeah. So, um, okay. but So we have that distinction. And then the next verse... 
Then they lay their hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, so initially the sacrament of confirmation was given, and we'll look at other, other evidence of this, by a laying on of hands. And notice who was it given by? Yeah, the apostles or the bishops, the, the overseers of the church, mm -hmm. right? And so even though others were going out and baptizing them, they had to call the apostles in to give the gift of the Holy Spirit. And why is that? Why would that be specifically the apostles or the bishops of the church? You can just... Maybe, Sue, could you just pick that up and hang it back down? It's a junk call. Nobody calls me that number. Well, why is that? Because they had re the apostles had received the Holy Spirit. When? At Pentecost. At Pentecost. And also, you remember when our Lord appeared to them, right? And he breathed upon them and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. So the apostles in particular in Scripture are given this gift. And that special gift is then lived out in the early church by calling the apostles specifically to be able to hand this gift on. Okay, so it's something always maintained. It's always proper to the bishop to confirm. Okay, uh, also in chapter 19, verse 5. Let's look at that real quick. 19, verse 5. Can you want to read that for us? 19, verse 5. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Okay. There were about twelve of them in all. Okay, so again, you see that practice, that early practice of laying on of hands. But today, what do we normally associ associate with the sacrament of confirmation? Chrism. Chrism. Yeah, chrism, the holy oils, right? And why is that? Why is that? Early on, the practice of laying on of hands, early on in the church, was replaced or buttressed, or in addition to the laying on of hands, an anointing with oil. Okay? Turn it to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Verse 34. Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Sue, you want to read that for us? And Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the word which he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace by Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. The word which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went, up, went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Okay, so we hear that word anointing then associated with the Holy Spirit, that gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, when was Jesus anointed? And his baptism, right? The Holy Spirit descended upon him. But look, St. Luke, right, in Acts, uses that word anointing. And normally we associate an anointing with, right, the, the pouring on of oil. And in fact, in the Old Testament, that is exactly what they did. Poured oil upon people and upon all sorts of things in the temple. Okay, In order to do that very thing, call down the Holy Spirit to make the thing holy, to chrismate it. Or to chrismate the person. Okay? And notice St. Luke's language there in verse 36. You know the word which he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace by Jesus Christ. Now, what's the word Christ mean? Anointed. Yeah. Anointed. The, the anointed one. The anointed one. In fact, in the Gospel of John, in Acts chapter 1, after the baptism of our Lord, when John, you know, it's very interesting in, John, in the Gospel of John, he never explicitly says that Jesus was baptized. He never says that John took him and put him in the water. He never poured water on him or anything like that. He says, I saw the Holy Spirit descend upon him. And immediately, Peter, or Andrew, runs off to Peter and he says, I have found the Messiah. I found the Messiah. What's the word Messiah mean? Anointed. Anointed, same, right? In the, in the Hebrew, right? Uh, Messiah in the Hebrew, Christ or Christos in the Greek. Okay? So Jesus, the anointed one. 
In other words, the one who has received the Holy Spirit. Okay? So my next question is to you, what does confirmation or this gift of the Holy Spirit accomplish? We see it clearly in, in sacred scripture, the practice of it. We see it clearly as a distinct sacrament or a distinct thing taking place than baptism. What happens when we're baptized? Remind me, my dear friend, to the here. What happens when we're baptized? We spent two, five, two hours talking about it. <laughs> you are plunged into Christ, and in what? And give me more. Or you're plunged into Christ, but into the mystery of his death. passion, death, burial underneath the waters of baptism, as Eileen was buried in those waters in the creek, right? Covered over and brought back to life coming out of those waters, just like Christ coming out of the Jordan River. Just like Christ coming out of the tomb. Or I'd say, not just like Christ, but in Christ, walking out of the tomb. We are plunged into Him. And then, therefore, coming back from the dead, we are given the gift of life, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the life of God. So what does it particularly accomplish? What does it enable us to do? You would say baptism gives us, it brings us back to life, right? Doesn't, doesn't uh, baptism give us grace? Yeah, yes. Doesn't confirmation give us grace? Yeah. Okay. So what is specific about chrismation or confirmation? What is specific about, what does it enable us to do? To live, our, to live the life of Christ. It does. Look, is, is from Easter. Right. So it's a strengthening. Of, I mean, the Holy Chrism is always the oil that's back that's blessed at Easter time. Okay. So it's a complete fulfillment. So you're saying that baptism brings us back to life, but chris, chrismation or confirmation, in a sense, brings us into the fullness of that. Like, lets us live it out. And you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Okay, look at paragraph uh, 13, uh, 1302. 1302. Paragraph 1302 in your catechism. The effects of confirmation. 1302. Gretchen, you want to read for us? I know, I just had to point that out to you. It's. <laughs> It is evident from its celebration that the effect of the sacrament of confirmation... You guys with me? The effect of the sacrament of confirmation is the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit as once granted to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. So whatever happened to the apostles on the day of Pentecost, you could say, that happened to us, just like we talked about. Those that are baptized into Christ walk through the Red Sea with Moses. So similarly, those who are chrismated or confirmed stand on the day of Pentecost and enter into the mystery of the reception of the Holy Spirit. So we have to ask ourselves, what happened to them? What was different about their lives after that reality took place? But continue reading, 1303. From this fact... You can leave it open if you want. We won't lock you up. I'm not sure what she said. From this fact, confirmation brings an increase and deepening of baptismal grace. It roots us more deeply in the divine filiation, sonship, which makes us cry, Abba, Father. It unites us more firmly to Christ. It increases the gifts of the Holy Spirit in us. It renders our bond with the church more perfect. It gives us special strength of the Holy Spirit to spread and defend the faith by word and action as true witnesses of Christ to confess the name of Christ bodily and never to be ashamed of the cross. What is, what's striking you about that paragraph? What's interesting about it? It emboldens you. Yeah. Notice, it's not saying it gives you this, it gives you that. It's, it keeps saying more, deepens, finishes. Recall the first paragraph we read tonight. The church says the unity of the sacraments must be safeguarded because without it, without it, you do have a cripple. 
Right? With the sacraments, the full initiation into the church, a person is given, if they're willing, if they're open to that life, they're given the full ability to live the Christian life. Okay? But there's more. There's more. Go back to Acts chapter 2 and chapter 3. Acts chapter 2 and 3. In Acts chapter 2, what did we get? We got the day of Pentecost, right? And I ask you, what was different about the apostles' life after the day of Pentecost? What's different about it afterwards than before? What happened to them? What's that? All right, they were, they were on fire, they had more courage. There's something even more than that. What's that? They could heal. Now, why is that important? Why is that important? Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Suddenly, at the day of Pentecost, the entire life and the, and the mission of the apostles changes suddenly. They're empowered to do something which only before Christ had done, the anointed one had done. Okay? Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of those who entered the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him with John and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention upon them and expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but I give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. So with the gift of the Holy Spirit, they're able to heal. But what does that tell us about the change in, in the man? What does it tell us about the change in the man? How does that change their relationship to creation and to their fellow men? It's kind of a vague question, but... They're now acting with Christ in them, not by their own human abilities. Okay. Now Christ acts through them. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, I'm saying, look, suddenly... Peter and John are able to do something to this other man that they couldn't do before. Okay, so what could we say? I would, I like to, yeah. I would just say pass on faith. God's but they're not just pass on faith. Yes, they're passing on faith, but they're able literally to act upon creation, to order it. They become Christ. When yeah, they've that. been anointed with the Holy Spirit. Right. Notice, what happens in the life of Jesus when he is anointed with the Holy Spirit or when the day of his baptism comes? What changes in his life? What begins on that day? His mission. His mission. Right? His public life. And what does he do in his public life? He's walking all around healing the sick spiritually and physically. And suddenly, on the day of Pentecost, the same thing begins to happen at the hands of the apostles. Okay? Now, what, what kind of man, for the Jews, what kind of man was anointed? What kind of man received the gift of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? Righteous man. Yeah. Kings. Kings? Yeah. Prophets. Prophets, yeah. Who else? Priests. And priests, that's true. At the time of Christ specifically, what kind of man were they looking for to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? What kind of man were the Jews looking for? They were looking for the Messiah. When they saw, when, 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 when Peter, when, when Andrew ran to Peter and said, we found the Messiah, they're specifically talking about the King of Israel. The one who is anointed. And what gift does a king have over his kingdom? Healing. What's that? Healing. Power. Leadership. Power. Healing. Power. How about dominion? <laughs> dominion. Right? He has an ability to reign over his dominion, over his kingdom. Right? And when a righteous king reigns over his kingdom, what does he do to his kingdom? What is accomplished in his kingdom? Unity. Alright, unity. Well, let's get away from the Jesus stuff for a second. Let's say, okay. But, 
Yeah, unity. And how is unity accomplished? Trust. By their allegiance to him or their service to him. Okay. Trust to him. How is the relationship between the different parts of the community? A good king always puts his kingdom in order. A good king orders his kingdom so that it functions properly. Am I right? Mm -hmm. That is the function. That is the goal of a good king. To be able to say, you, this is your job, and you have to fulfill it in order for the rest of the kingdom to function properly. Right? He has the ability to go through his kingdom and order it properly such that it functions as it should. And notice what the apostles do on the day of Pentecost. They walk, and the first person they run into is someone whose leg is not working right. And what do they say? Get right. Right? Stand up. Function properly. Christ, the King, walks through the Holy Land, and His entire mission is about healing this creation, which had been disfigured by sin. And He, because He is King, because of His rightful... Um, uh, place to the uh, uh, inheritance of the throne is able to walk to those places and say literally be healed, right? To sit, to pick out the different points in his kingdom that were out of order and to put them in right order, whether it was spiritual order, physical order. And only the king has that power and ability. No other person in the kingdom can do that. Okay. Turn back to 1 Kings real quick. 1 Kings um, chapter 32. Look at that. There is no chapter 32. No, 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 sorry. 1 Kings chapter 1. Chapter 1. 1 Kings. Chapter 1. Mm hmm. Verse 32. This is about David and Solomon. King David is, is uh, getting old, and he says in verse 32, says, King David said, Call me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaniah the son of Jehoiada. So they came before the king, and the king said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and cause Solomon, my son, to ride upon my own mule, and bring him down to Gihon. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel. Then blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. <laughs> Notice the language that they use. Anoint him king over Israel. And notice the language that Luke chose to use in Acts chapter 10. He was anointed and he received the Holy Spirit. In other words, he was made king over his dominion, over his over his place over his creation. Okay? And notice the kind of king that Christ is, that Jesus is, or the kind of king the apostles are. Are they kings of a particular dominion of McLean or a particular area of McLean or Virginia? Notice what realm do the apostles receive on the day of Pentecost? Creation itself. They were able to reach down to the very depths of creation and put that creation back in order. Okay? We get a similar example of this in um, in 2 Samuel, or 1 Samuel, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6. Or not verse 6, verse 1. This is the anointing of Saul. Chapter 10, 1 Samuel, just before 1 Kings. I'm sorry, uh, just before 2 Samuel, which is just before 1 Kings. Chapter 10, 1 Samuel, chapter 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over his people over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their enemies round about. Look at verse 6. Verse 6. And then the Spirit of the Lord will come mightily upon you, and you shall prophesy with them and be turned into another man. 
So there, in the anointing of Saul, we get kind of all of those points coming together. The gift of the Holy Spirit, okay? The anointing through oil, okay? And with both of those things taking place, he becomes king. He receives his dominion, okay? Turn with me real quick to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter... I believe it's chapter 6. Uh, it's not. It's Ezekiel chapter maybe 36. Let's see here. Uh, chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. Where is Ezekiel? Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel's right in the midst of the prophets. So you're going to go like uh, past the Psalms, past Isaiah, past Jeremiah, right? And so forth. We gotta get back to having more Bible studies in here, don't we? Yeah. All right. Ezekiel chapter thirty-six. I'm working on, you know, I'm right now I'm working on the book of Revelation. Yeah. Yeah. Ezekiel chapter thirty-six. Ezekiel chapter thirty-six. Ezekiel, what did you say? Chapter? Chapter 36. There you go. Verse 24. I'm getting there. Verse 24. I believe. For I will take you from the nation. Remember the prophets are talking? Always remember, the prophets are speaking of the fulfillment of when the Messiah comes. When the Messiah is restored. And the reason why when the king is restored. The reason for that friends that took the Salvation History series. The reason for that is because they lost their king during the Babylonian exile. And so the prophets are always looking forward to the day of the restoration when the Messiah will come, when the anointed one will come. And look at the language. For I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from your, all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will take out of your flesh the heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes. And be careful to observe my ordinances. You shall dwell in the land which I gave your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God." So notice right there in the prophecy, there's other ones we could look at, but we don't have time. This gift of the Holy Spirit being prophesied, where man would receive the Spirit or the life of God within him. And sure enough, on the day of Pentecost, at the restoration of all things, that gift is given. Okay? We need to look at one other thing real quick. <laughs> Why do we have to elect a president next Tuesday? Couldn't they move it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, All right, we have to look at, at, at one more thing real quick, and that is the question of always, or not a question, a point that you need to always keep in mind, and that is that whenever something is taking place in the New Testament as a restoration, it's not enough to look to the prophets. The prophets are prophesying a restoration because that very thing was lost. Always, always, always ask yourself, when was this lost? What is it restoring to me? Because Jesus Christ and the sacraments do not give us anything new. They restore man to that which God wanted for us from the beginning. Okay? If we forget that, the sacraments will soon become magic to us. If I get this little thing, well, this thing will happen to me. Fine. That might be partially true. But God wanted us to have that because it's the way he made us. Okay? Turn back to Genesis then real quick. Last thing we'll look at here. Genesis chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 6. Verse 7, chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. In other words, God's breath, his ruach, we had talked about this last time. That word in Hebrew can also be translated as spirit. He breathed his spirit into Adam and Eve. 
And when he breathed his spirit into them, what happened to them? Chapter 1 and chapter 2 are a repetition of each other, giving us from a new perspective. Okay? So flip back to chapter 1 to the creation of man, and we'll see it. Verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over the... All the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. What do you think he means by have dominion over these things? Spiritual. That we were made to put creation in order. To make sure all of the parts of creation were functioning as they should be. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him, male and female created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, most like fill the earth, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and the living things that move upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree with the seed its fruit, you shall have for food. And every beast of the earth, and every bird of the air, and every living, and so forth. What's he saying? He's saying, look, all of these things of creation. Here, this is for food for you. This is to help you do your work. This is how you use this thing. All of creation to be at the disposal of man. To make creation be what it's supposed to be. To till and keep the earth. To bring about on earth that which God intended for it. And that is the gift of chrismation. That is the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we say that man is emboldened at his confirmation to go out and become a witness to Christ, it is simply because he has dominion over creation. And it is the message of Jesus Christ that will heal creation. He's given a new heart within him to be able to act in a new way, to have dominion and kingship over this earth. But unfortunately, what do we do? Mess up. Not only do we mess it up, we just throw it out and say, you know, I'm too embarrassed. So, you know, we talk about the, the, the person not being confirmed being, being crippled. You know, we're crippled when we don't put our, the sacraments to use. At your hands, God will change the world if we would let him. But he won't do it without us. He's not going to convert anyone without us. He's not going to give anybody the life of God without us. And the person standing in the grocery line, or the person standing outside a church on Sunday, how many times we walk in the church and there's somebody standing there and we walk right by them? On Judgment Day, I think God's going to have the big video camera, the, the TV, and he's just going to put play, and he's going to say, he's going to watch us walk by the person, and that person's going to walk down to McLean Bible Church and stop going. And we're going to answer for it. When it's in our hands that that person that was in need could be brought to the fullness of their love for Christ. That's okay. That's enough on the Okay. Oh, I misunderstand. Oh. Okay, we got to go over a couple misunderstandings and confirmations before we move on to the Eucharist for three minutes. Um, real quick. Twelve ninety. Twelve ninety. Class next week. Twelve ninety. We can't do it next week. Why? Because it's election day. So. I've got to go vote. Nobody's gonna come. No. Look. Nobody else goes at seven. Yeah, and everybody's going to be watching the election results, aren't they? All right, all right, all right, all right. 1290, 1290. Here we go, real quick. 1290. In the first century, confirmation generally comprised one single celebration with baptism, forming with it a, quote, double sacrament, according to the expression of St. Cyprian. Among other reasons, the multiplication of infant baptisms all through the year, the increase of rural parishes, the growth of diocese, often prevent the bishop from being present at all baptismal celebrations. In the West, the desire to reserve, reserve the completion of baptism to the bishop caused the temporal separation of the two sacraments. The East has kept them united so that confirmation is conferred by the priest who baptizes, but he can do so only with the myron consecrated by a bishop. If you want to see that, the ancient practice of an infant being baptized and confirmed and receiving Holy Eucharist, this Sunday in my parish is going to be a child that's going to be baptized, confirmed, and receive Holy Communion. How old? 
Uh, an infant just bat, just born uh, just a couple weeks ago, a relative of mine actually. Uh, a custom of the Roman Church facilitated the development of the Western practice, a double anointing with sacred chrism after baptism. The first anointing of the neophyte on coming out of the baptismal bath was performed by the priest. It was completed by a second anointing on the forehead of the newly baptized by the bishop. So look, what they're saying is that when, you, when you're at the, at the church here and you see that child uh, anointed with oil right after baptism, it's because initially that was the confirmation. Okay, and so they're placing an anointing in there, and you listen on on uh, on Easter at the vigil mass when the person is confirmed. The priest picks up, or the bishop, and the bishop's here to a confirmation. He picks up the baptismal rite and finishes it. Okay, that's why we repeat our baptismal promises on that day. Right? So that the person is ready now to finish what was begun on the day of their baptism. Of course, I'm going to yes. St. John the Baptist yeah. uh, said, uh, Repent. And usually they put the confession before the baptisms. Correct. Right. The, the what now? The, the St. John the yeah. Baptist. Yes. Uh, they put they the, call people up to, to repent, repent. Yeah. before he baptized. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So should we put the Sacrament or confession. confession before the baptism, before the confirmation? Uh, it's a confession and a simple repentance is a different thing. Okay? What, he, what, he's, what was happening with John is not a sacramental confession, okay? but simply a what we do before we go to confession, right? Say, I'm sorry, Lord, and now that brings us to the sacramental confession, which baptism accomplishes. Baptism wipes away all sin. Venial, mortal, original, gone. Okay, so it, it accomplishes what you're looking for there. Okay, but what's the difference between a sacramental uh, confession versus the, the confession this of prior to the baptism? Right, right. We have to leave now. Okay, I'll tell you what, let's, just, let's, let's leave that. We'll take a couple questions afterwards and maybe clarify, okay? Because otherwise we'll never get through this. All right. Um, uh, 12 or 1308, real quick. 1308. After confirmation is, although confirmation is sometimes called the sacrament of Christian maturity, we must not confuse adult faith with adult age of natural growth, nor forget that the baptismal grace is a grace of free, unmerited election and does not need ratification to become effective. St. Thomas, St. Thomas reminds us of this. Age of body does not determine the age of the soul, and so forth. Okay? So, we are not... It, it, get that out of your mind. That confirmation makes somebody... or well, Okay, fine, it makes somebody adult or completes it in the faith. Fine. But never reverse that and say that then only an adult or one who fully understands the sacrament can receive the sacrament of confirmation. Not Catholic theology. Okay? All right. Um... For uh, thirteen fourteen, if a Christian thirteen fourteen, if a Christian is in the danger of death, any priest should give him confirmation. Indeed, the Church desires that none of her children, even the youngest, should depart this world without having been perfected by the Holy Spirit with the gift of Christ's fullness. Okay, and back to thirteen oh seven, real quick. 1307, the Latin tradition gives the age of discretion as a reference point for receiving confirmation. But, in the danger of death, children should be confirmed even if they have not yet attained the age of discretion. Are we all clear on that? Good. The Eucharist, 1322 in uh, 60 seconds. 1322. What a tragedy. <laughs> Guys, I have very few notes on the Eucharist because we, as Catholics, know quite a bit about it. Yes. Okay? So here's what I'm going to do. Some of you need to leave. I'm sure you're more than welcome to leave at this moment to stand up and make your exit. Otherwise, what I'll do is go on for about 15 minutes more on the Eucharist. So those that want to stay around are more than welcome to. Those that need to leave, I totally understand. Can I ask you a couple of sure. questions? Sure. Is the age of discretion the same age 
actually determined by the diocese, or who determines that? Yeah. Because I know, like, wherever I live, the information yeah. happens to be different. Had different ages, right. So age of discretion is, um, is kind of usually seven years old is considered the age of discretion. Um, and so you ask yourself, well, why are they confirming when they're 15, right? And that is, and the practice itself then is at the disposal of the bishop. Okay. okay. So, yes. Uh, except in those situations where it's an emergency, does it always have to be a bishop to confirm? No, and that's why the Easter Vigil, because the bishop can't be here for all the Easter Vigils, right? The, the priest is given the power to chrismate. Does it have to be, uh, does he have to petition the bishop? Yes, he does. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yep. Now, yeah. in your church, uh, a child is baptized, baptized chrismated, confirmed. Yeah, but yep. they, they, you... In the water. water. That's right. Just like you were, Eileen. Yeah. Except yeah. without the river. <laughs> All right. Thirteen twenty-two. The Holy Eucharist completes Christian initiation. Those who have been raised to the dignity of the royal priesthood by baptism and configured more deeply to Christ by confirmation participate with the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice by means of the Eucharist. The Lord's own sacrifice by means of the Eucharist. What is the Lord's sacrifice? His passion. What is the content of the Lord's sacrifice? His body. His death, right? How many of you guys listened to me and actually got your papers before the class? Not too many. Yes? <laughs> Okay, page 27 there. Page 27. This is Cardinal Ratzinger, Spirit of the Liturgy. Um, page 27. At, the, at the, the last paragraph. Once again, we are faced with the question of what is worship. What happens when we worship? In all religions, sacrifice is at the heart of worship. But this is a concept that has been buried under the debris of endless misunderstandings. The common view is that sacrifice is something to do with destruction. Yes, friends? Yes. Right? The death of Christ. Jesus was destroyed. Right? The lamb is destroyed. So forth. The common view is that sacrifice has something to do with destruction. It means handing over to God a reality that is in some way precious to man. Now this handing over presupposes that it is withdrawn from the use by man. From use by man. Yeah, is that what we oftentimes think? And that can happen only through its destruction, its definitive removal from the hands of man. But this immediately raises the question, what pleasure is God supposed to take in destruction? Is anything really surrendered to God through destruction? One answer is that the destruction conceals within itself the act of acknowledging God's sovereignty over all things. But can such a mechanical act really serve God's glory? Obviously not. True surrender to God looks very different. It consists, according to the fathers, in fidelity to biblical thought, in the union of man and creation with God. Belonging to God has nothing to do with destruction or non-being. It is rather a way of being. It means emerging from the state of separation, of apparent autonomy, of existing only for oneself and in oneself. It means losing oneself as the only possible way of finding oneself. That is why St. Augustine could say that the true sacrifice is the Chivitas Dei, the city of God. That is, love transformed mankind, the divinization of creation, and the surrender of all things to God, God all in all. That is the purpose of the world. That is the essence of sacrifice and worship. It has nothing to do with non-being. It has everything to do with being. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ was not pleasing to the Father because the Father, in a bloodthirsty manner, desired that His Son suffer and die. But He desired that His Son reconcile all men to Him by giving the divine life to mankind once again. And the only way for mankind to receive that divine life was for Christ to enter into the very spot, the place 
where it was absent, namely death. And when the life of God, when eternal life enters into the place where existence is not, death is a lack of existence. And when Christ entered into death, he brought life into that place and destroyed its very nature from within. Go ahead, Chris. Um, oh, oh, wait, but is this the true meaning of the atonement doctrine of salvation? That's not, yes, right? So, okay. Well, no, I'm just, okay, we talk about atonement, and this is a, this is a good point, is that the sacrifice of Christ must begin to be seen as not a separation from God, but a return to God. Cardinal Ratzinger talks about, I mentioned this last time, the Exodus and Reditus, that in, in creation, God in love poured himself out into creation, culminating in the, in the creation of man. But man did exactly what, exactly what Ratzinger is saying there. It means emerging from a state of separation, think Adam, apparent autonomy of existing only for oneself and in oneself. That's Adam. And he says that Jesus Christ entered into death and took the lost sheep upon his shoulders and carried man back to God. That's the true sacrifice, and that is why we call the Eucharist the Eucharist. What does it mean? Thanksgiving. In Greek, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for what? For the rest of the life. Returning us to God for life. Yeah, Thanksgiving for life. Adam was made to offer the Eucharist in the beginning, and he refused to offer the Eucharist. In other words, he refused to give back all that God had given him. The surrender of all things to God. Because God had given everything to man, man was made to stand and in love give what he had received back to God and in that be united in the covenant to be transformed, be divinized by the life of God. And Adam refused to do that. When Jesus Christ offered the Eucharist, he offered himself in thanksgiving. And every time we offer the Eucharist in the liturgy, Read that paragraph. The Holy Eucharist completes the Christian initiation. Those who have been raised to the dignity of the royal priesthood by the baptism and configured or deeply in Christ by confirmation participate with the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice by means of the Eucharist, by the Lord's own thanksgiving, by standing in Christ and raising up our hands, our whole life to God and giving Him back what He has given us. That's the meaning of the liturgy. That's the meaning of the Eucharist. Sorry, I, I get too fired up. Calm <laughs> <laughs> myself down. Okay, 13, uh, 1324. The Eucharist is the source and the summit of the Christian life. 1324. The other sacraments, indeed, all of these go ministries, the works of the apostle are bound up with the Eucharist and are oriented toward it. For in the blessed Eucharist, or the thanksgiving, is contained the whole spiritual good of the church, namely Christ himself, our Pasch. What's it mean, Pasch? Passover. Our Passover. And what's our Passover? What's, he, what's this mean? Life. What's that? Death to life. Exactly. 13, 13, uh, 40. 1340. 1340. By celebrating the Last Supper with his apostles in the course of the Passover meal, Jesus gave the Jewish Passover its definitive meaning. Jesus is passing over from his Father over to his Father by his death and resurrection. The new Passover is anticipated in the Supper and celebrated in the Eucharist, which fulfills the Jewish Passover, anticipates the final Passover of the church in the glory of the kingdom, right? The coming out of Egypt, the passing over Right? The f being freed from the slavery in Egypt. Being freed from the angel of death. Right? And coming to life at Mount Sinai. Okay? Where they would come face to face with God. Okay. Um, 1345. 1345, real quick. As early as the second century, we have the witness of St. Justin Martyr for the basic lines of the order of the Eucharistic celebration. They have stayed the same into our own day for all the great liturg liturgical families. St. Justin wrote to the pagan emperor Antoni 
Antoninus, Pius, in 138, around the, or, sorry, 138, in the year 155, explaining what Christians did. This is what he says. How early? 155, so he says. On a day we call the day of the sun, all who dwell in the city or country gather in the same place. The memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets are read. The epistle, right? As much as time permits. In those days, the bishop would be enthroned, and the guy would be reading, and he'd say, All right, that's enough. <laughs> okay? Um, when the reader had finished, he who presides over the is gathered and admonishes and challenges them to imitate the beautiful, these beautiful things. Uh-huh. 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 Then we all rise together and offer prayers for ourselves. Prayers of the faithful. And for all others, wherever they may be, so that we may be found righteous by our life and action, the faithful to the commandments, so as to obtain eternal salvation. And then, or when the prayers are concluded, we exchange the kiss. Then someone brings bread and a cup of water and wine mixed together to him who presides over the bread and so forth. Okay? There it is, 155. So what you're doing on Sunday is uh, is not a new thing. 1348, very important for us today in our in our liturgical disaster in which we find ourselves oftentimes, 1348. It's a good thing to keep in mind. All gathered together, Christians come together in one place for the Eucharistic assembly. At its head is Christ himself, the principal agent of the Eucharist. He is the high priest of the new covenant. It is he himself who presides invisibly over every Eucharistic celebration. It is in, rep- is in, it is in representing him that the bishop or the priest, acting in persona, in the person of Christ, of Christ the head, in persona Christi Capitis, presides over the assembly, speaks after the readings, receives the offerings, and says the Eucharistic prayer. Now listen to this. All have their own active parts to play in the celebration, each in its own way. Readers, those who bring up the offerings, those who give communion, those who, uh, and, and, and the whole people whose amen manifests their participation. I talked to you last time about the body of Christ and about one being an ear and one a foot and one a hand within the body. Unfortunately, we all want to be the head. <laughs> okay? If you're writing your notes down, write down 1 Corinthians chapter 10 on that point. One's a foot, one's a hand. If the hand doesn't want to be a hand anymore, instead wants to be a foot, we're all in a bunch of trouble. Because we don't have a hand. Right? So never, 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 never think that because your place in the liturgy isn't grand and glorious on the high altar, that your position in the liturgy isn't essential to the liturgy. It is essential. Whether it be singing the hymns or saying the amen, whatever it might be, it's essential. And if you don't do that part, we will all suffer. And if you do somebody else's part, we will all suffer. Okay? And that goes across the board, whether it's doing reading, or whether it's being a Eucharistic minister, an extraordinary minister of the Eucharist, or anything. Examine what the church teaches on this subject, and only then fulfill your part within the body of Christ with knowledge. Make sure you're not doing a part that is not your part to do. Okay? Because I will suffer, and you will suffer. Okay. Um... 1356, I think we can skip that. Um, okay, I'll finish with this. I'll finish with this. I'm not going to pull up the catechism at all. I'll finish with this because we talked a lot about always using the Old Testament and the whole scriptures as our background and seeing the same sacraments, right? And when we consider the Eucharist, what image comes to mind from the Old Testament? Sacrifice of lamb. Okay, the sacrifice of the lamb. Right? A willing sacrifice of Isaac who carried the wood on his shoulders for his old dad who was too old to do it, right? A willing sacrifice. What else? What other images of the Eucharist do we have in the Old Testament? Manna. The manna, right? God feeding his people through the desert of this world so that they can come to the promised land. Bread wine sacrifice Melchizedek. Yeah, Melchizedek sacrifice we mentioned in the liturgy itself, right? That's right. If we understand, we keep these things in mind, we're going to be much better equipped to understand what we're doing in the sacraments. But we've skipped the most important one, friends. And what is it? 
the most important image of the Eucharist in the Old Testament. Just like we talked about confirmation being a restoration of what we lost in the fall. We always have to understand the sacraments in terms of restoring to us that which Adam lost. If we don't do that, if we lose sight of that, then we will lose sight of that which Jesus has saved us from. We lost some things in the fall, and that's what Christ came to give us back. Okay? Turn, last thing we're going to do, turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. This is post-fall here. Part of the, part of the, uh, right after the um, curses. Genesis 3 chapter, uh, chapter 3 verse 22. Then the Lord God said, verse 22, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also from the tree of life. Remember, he had eaten from the tree of knowledge and received death. Lest he put forth his hand and eat from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground. The reason Adam and Eve were cast out of paradise was so that they would not have access to the tree of life. And so I ask you, why would God not want them to have access to eternal life? Not you, Chris, somebody else. Why would he not want them to live forever? Because they would have lived separated from him. Good. St. Ephraim says, if they had eaten from the tree of life in the fallen state, they would have received eternal death. They would have lived forever as though buried alive. They would have been in hell. God in his mercy, therefore, separated man from that which was to be his salvation. From the tree of life, they would receive eternal life. That's God's life. Through a material thing in the world. Through a piece of fruit. That was God's plan in the beginning. So when Jesus Christ came to save us, to give us that back which we lost at the fall, he repeated those words. If you eat of my flesh and you drink my blood, you will receive eternal life. Repeating the words of Genesis chapter 3. If he hadn't have done that, I would not stand before you as a Christian today because Jesus Christ would not have saved us from that which we lost at the fall. But he did. The Eucharist gives us back as Christ hangs upon the tree of the cross that St. Paul calls it. The tree of the cross. And he says, Come and eat my flesh and drink my blood and you will live forever. And in doing that, he invited us back into paradise. Always, always, always understand the sacraments in light of Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. And in light of the entire Old Testament. And if you do that, then those times in your church and you're bored out of your mind, things will begin to change. Things will begin to change.